we're going to discuss terrorism. It, uh, it is still a political crime or a type of political crime, but it has its own category. Uh, despite its long history, it is often difficult to precisely define it, terrorism, and to separate terrorist acts from interpersonal crimes of violence. Like if a group robs a bank to obtain funds for its revolutionary struggles, should the act be treated as terrorism or as a common bank robbery? In this instance, defining a crime as terrorism depends on the kind of legal response the act invokes from those in power. To be considered terrorism, an act must carry with it the intent to disrupt or change the government and must not merely be a common law crime committed for greed and egotism. In recent years, crimes involving terrorism have risen in the U.S. and abroad. The federal government has enacted several criminal statutes with severe penalties um, over the years to combat terrorism. In 1986, the government enacted the Omnibus Diplomatic Security and Anti-Terrorism Act. In 1996, after the Oklahoma City bombing, Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act was passed. In response to 9-11, the U.S. Patriot Act, which stands for Uniting and Strengthening America by Providing Appropriate Tools Required to Intercept and Obstruct Terrorism. Whew, that's a big one. USA Patriots Act. The Patriots Act changed existing laws, strengthening laws, and gave the U.S. enormous capabilities to prosecute terrorism committed uh, across the globe gave U.S. federal jurisdiction over crimes committed outside of the U.S., created crimes involving financial support of terrorism and terrorists abroad, provides the forfeiture of assets connected to terrorism, such as the government being able to take money and property from an individual who has uh, connected with terrorism, who is connected with terrorism. Uh, there are some controversial provisions to the extent that the government based on government surveillance, including emails and telephone inception. We're going to talk more about the Patriot Act towards the uh, end of our topic. Uh, just giving you an idea. Border Patrol right, can uh, racially profile. Basically, the U.S. Patriot Act has given it full reign to stop vehicles within a 99-mile radius of a border. So they can totally stop cars randomly. And if you live in the North Country... You have seen that happen, especially on the, on the highway. The Department of Homeland Security enforces the laws under the Act, along with assistance from Secret Service, Customs, Border Patrol, Coast Guard, and a number of other federal agencies. Um, defining terrorism, international terrorism, is violent acts committed outside the U.S. that would be criminal if committed in the U.S., and that appear to be intended to influence the civilian population or government by intimidation or to affect the conduct of government by mass destruction, uh, assassination, or kidnapping. Domestic terrorism is the same exact definition, except the acts are committed within the territory of the U.S. Terrorist acts can happen anywhere, and they're not necessarily uh, all involving political goals. So I think we have to distinguish our terrorists, who is a terrorist, who is a guerrilla, who is insurgent, who's a revolutionary, because they are all different while the terms tend to be used interchangeably. So let's take a, a look. Terrorists. We'll use my little, my chart. Terrorists. Uh, it's the same one in the book. Operates a small band and targets persons or property of the enemy, may not have political ambitions, actions may be aimed at stifling or intimidating other groups who oppose their political, social, or economic views. Our guerrilla focuses on military forces. They are actually armed military. Generally, they're located in rural areas and attack military, law enforcement, and government in an effort to destabilize or cause an unrest in the existing government. Our insurgent 
a member of an insurgency. An, injur an insurgency is a political movement. And uh, this member, the insurgent, confronts the existing government for control of all or part of its territory or political power. They generally have support from other countries, including shelter and resources, Taliban, the Islamic State fall in this, this category, the, those uh, terrorist groups. And then we have the revolutionary. These folks engage in civil war against the sovereign powers that control the land. And the, the example we all know about is the American Revolution, the Revolutionary War. But a lot of revolutions take place in other uh, countries you've seen in the news over the last 20, 30 years. Well, maybe not you guys, maybe me, but still it's a, it's an up, an uprising of, uh, creating the turmoil of the civil war against the government that controls the, the land. Let's talk about the history, the history in the book and the history that I'm going to give you is really a snapshot, uh, of terrorism. It's, uh, certainly has its, uh, these style tactics that we know uh, constitute terroristic style uh, attacks. Even though they didn't have that name, they extend back from the Roman times. The term terrorism itself was first referenced in 1793 uh, regarding the reign of terror during the French Revolution War. Originally, Terrorism was an instrument of the state. And we're going to talk about that. We already kind of did with torture, state implementing uh, criminal acts, in this case, acts of terrorism. And they do, and they still do. But terrorism was originally an instrument of the state. The regimen was designed to consolidate the power of the, new, the newly installed revolutionary government, protecting it from elements considered subversive. Always thought to be value-laden, terrorism was initially a positive thing. French revolutionary leaders viewed it as vital if the new French Republic was to survive its infancy, proclaiming that terror is nothing other than justice, prompt, severe, inflexible. It is therefore and emancipation of virtue. It is not so much a special principle as it is a consequence of the general principle of democracy applied to our country's most urgent needs. That's the quote from the French Republic. So under the justification, some 40,000 people were executed by guillotine, most of them revolutionists. Before long, the revolution kind of devoured itself, and terrorism itself began taking on a negative uh, connotation as the one that it carries today. Russian Revolution, long before the outbreak of World War I in Europe in 1914, what would later be termed state-sponsored terrorism, had already started to manifest itself. For instance, many officials in the Serbian government and military were involved I'll say quote unquote unofficially in supporting training and arming the various terrorist groups like the Balkan. Balkan was a terrorist group which were active prior to the assassination of the uh, Archduke in 1914. Nationalist groups such as those in Ireland and the Balkans uh, adopted terrorism as a means toward their desired ends. So those were kind of adopted through the state, pre-war, uh, 19, actually this is uh, about the start of World War One, 1931s or maybe in the mist, saw a fresh wave of political assassinations, uh, which deserved the word terrorism. This led to proposals at the League of Nations for conventions to prevent and punish terrorism, as well as the establishment of an international criminal court neither of which kind of happened because they were overshadowed by what became the eventual events leading to World War II. So despite this, during this interim period between World War I and World War II, terrorism increasingly 
referred to the oppressive measures imposed by various totalitarian, totalitarian uh, regimens like those in Nazi Germany and in Italy and Russia under Stalin. More, um, more recently, other governments such as those military dictatorships which ruled some of South American countries in recent years or the current regimen in Zimbabwe have also been open to charges of using such methods as a tool of the state, using terrorism. Since World War II, the rise of non-state groups in the use of terrorism emerged through the 1960s and 70s. The numbers of those groups that might be described as terrorists swelled to include not only nationalists, but those motivated by ethnic uh, considerations. The former included groups such as the Palestinian Liberation Organization, that's mentioned throughout the, the reading, and the Irish Republican Army, while they later comprised organizations such as the Red Army Faction, kind of grew out of that, and the Italian Red Brigades. So these were separate uh, emerging non-state groups that were emerging. And by the mid-1980s, state-sponsored terrorism re-emerged, the catalyst for the series of attacks against American and other Western targets in the Middle East, countries such as Iran, Iraq, Libya, and Syria, came to the uh, fore as the principal such sponsors of terrorism. So they were backed by countries. Falling into the related category were those countries such as North Korea, who also directly participated in acts that would be described as terrorism. And such state-sponsored terrorism remains a concern of the international community today, especially the Western countries, although it has been somewhat overshadowed in the recent times by the emergence of the religiously inspired terrorists. The latest manifestation of this trend began in 1979 when the revolution that transformed Iran into the Islamic Republic led it to use and support terrorism as a means of uh, propagating its ideals beyond its own border. Before long, the trend spread beyond Iran to places as far as Japan and the United States and beyond Islam to the ever major world religion, as well as many minor cults. From the Saren, uh, Saren attack uh, in Tokyo, in the Tokyo subway in 1995, to Oklahoma bombing the next year, or no, actually that was in 1995 too, uh, religion was again added to the complex mix of motivations that led to acts of terrorism. And the Al Qaeda attacks of September 11, 2001, just brought it home again to the world, and most particularly the US, just how dangerous the latest mutation of terrorism is. Today, the term terrorism encompasses many different behaviors and goals, which is the topic of our next discussion of contemporary forms of terrorism. Now, terrorism, terrorism acts are criminal because they violate criminal law, because they involve criminal activity, and because they produce criminal results. The primary distinction between violent criminal acts and acts of terrorism, however, is to, um, is motivated by political motivation of the offender. The political motivation, social ideas of the offender mentioned this at the beginning. Political terrorism is directed at those who oppose the terrorist political ideology, not necessarily seek to replace the government, but rather get into shape, uh, get the government to shape its views and accept the views from the point of the terrorists. What we are talking about here is domestic terrorism committed on U.S. soil by generally by U.S. citizens. And we have two category groups, and you've heard these terms before, right wing and left wing. Uh, they've certainly been drawing a lot of attention. I don't know if it's social, you know, social media or the, the heightened level 
that we're dealing with these kind of political groups. We have the right-wing political groups that are motivated by fascist ideas and work toward the dissolution of democratic economic systems. The book identifies a number of examples. Neo-Nazis, skinheads, white supremacists, these groups seem to be on the rise. Our left-wing terrorists seek to replace economies based on free enterprise with social and communist economic systems. And there's a number of examples in the book regarding uh, that conduct. But during the past several years, special interest extremists are uh, as categorized by the Animal Liberation Front and the Earth Liberation Front. They have emerged. And those are the, the examples in the, in the book of their, their attacks. Um, but they've emerged as a, a terrorist threat. The FBI estimates that these groups have committed approximately 600 criminal acts in the U.S. since 1996, resulting in damages of more than $42 million. In the 1990s, right-wing extremists overtook left-wing terrorism as the most dangerous domestic terrorist threat to the country. Far-right extremists were behind two-thirds of the tax and plots in the U.S. in 2019 and more than 90% in the first half of this year. And then we have our revolutionary terrorism. These terrorists use violence to frighten those in power and their supporters in order to replace the existing government with a regime that holds political or religious views that the terror group finds acceptable. And there's a number of those examples uh, in the reading material. Nationalists. This promotes the interests of a minority ethnic or religious group that believes it has been persecuted under the majority rule. These groups seek to force the government to give them land so they can have their own nation. This is different from our revolutionists who wish to change their country, but they don't wish to have their own country, like the nationalists wish to have their own country. An example of them is the Irish Republic Army, the Al-Shabaab, Al -Shabaab, I think it's pronounced, in Africa, that group. They want to have their own country, a piece of their own country. Uh, then we have our retributive terrorism. These terrorists seek to punish people or governments for their uh, ideology, their political or religious reasons, not necessarily have their own government or homeland, though it could be that, but they'd seek to punish people uh, or governments. And the example of them is the Taliban or Al-Qaeda are examples of those groups. Uh, they promote taking up a cause. There is a, you know, a war of civilizations. Their, their view that they use, Al-Qaeda, uh, Al that is Al-Qaeda, is they promote taking up a cause. There is a war of civilizations. They, they, claim they claim, this is the message they put out there, there's a war of civilizations in which Jews and crusaders want to destroy Islam and must therefore be defeated and armed jihad is the obligation of every individual Muslim, and violence is the method for defeating it. And if you look up the definition of jihad, it's defined as a holy war waged on behalf of Islam as a religious duty. But it also means to Islam or to Al Qaeda a personal struggle and devotion to Islam, especially involving spiritual discipline, uh, to build a Muslim uh, society, and to defend Islam with force, if necessary, against non-believers. And that's their, their ammo, that's their motto, that's their message that they put out there to get support. Um, and these folks are slightly different uh, terrorists than the different ones from those we previously defined, you know, terrorists in general, the guerrillas, insurgents, and the revolutionists, because they have, even though they kind of fall under the insurgent category, they have unique characteristics um, that don't necessarily fall in line with a general insurgent as defined earlier. For these folks, violence is used to influence intimidate or persuade the larger target population or government. The target chosen that they choose is usually like an innocent 
innocent in the big picture, really has no power to do the changing. They choose their victims for maximum propaganda value, i.e. media coverage. Their goal is to maximize horror, so they target everyone. They use secrecy and surprise. They attack women, children. No one, their message is no one is safe. That that's makes them a bit unique in, uh, rather than being defined as a general uh, terrorist. Then we have state-sponsored terrorism. I've already touched on this in, a, in our history, but let's go over it. It's deliberate acts of terrorism employed by radical nations as foreign policy tools. For example, death squads, an armed parliamentary uh, uh, group formed to uh, kill particular people, especially political opponents. You know, the government puts out the death squad to go and end maybe a human rights group. Recently, the president of the Philippines issued such an order and kind of got, there was some backlash, came out in the news. Uh, another example was the Japanese Red Army. They were backed by Libya. Uh, Abu Nadal or, organization was ba- is, is backed by Syria and Libya. So state-sponsored terrorism. And then our last act of terrorism, probably the one you're more familiar with, the most familiar with, probably familiar with a lot of those. But what happens on our country, on uh, on our homeland? On August 3rd, 2019, there was a mass shooting that occurred at a Walmart store in El Paso. A gunman shot and killed 23 people and injured 23 others. The FBI investigated the shooting and called it an act of domestic terrorism and also a hate crime. The shooting shooting had been described as the the deadliest attack on Latinos in modern American history. The individual, Patrick uh, Crucis, I think how you say his name, Crucis, he's a 21-year-old from Allen, Texas, was arrested shortly after the shooting and charged with capital murder. Police believe... A manifesto with white nationalists and anti-immigrant themes posted on the online message board 8chan shortly before the attack was written by him, and it cites the year's uh, earlier shootings at the Christchurch Mosque and the right-wing conspiracy theory known as the Great Replacement as inspiration for the attacks. James Field Jr., who intentionally drove a car into a crowd during the United United the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia in 2007, killing one person. He uh, was charged with hate crimes and sentenced to life in prison. Robert Bowers allegedly killed 11 Jewish congregants at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh in 2018, was indicted on uh, hate crime charges. He's still waiting uh, his trial, but the prosecutors are seeking the death penalty. Caesar Sayak. Sayak was arrested in October 2018 for mailing multiple explosive devices to 13 people, including Democratic politicians. He was charged with using weapons of mass destruction, and he uh, he pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Political obsessions, right? Right, Right wing. You're hearing some of these stories that are coming out here. Do they fit? A profile, Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, was indicted on charges centered around transporting and mailing an explosive device uh, during a deadly mail bomb campaign. It lasted 17 years. It took the Fed 17 years to get uh, the Unabomber, and now he is serving a life sentence at a supermax. These are all examples of the lone wolf terrorists. The lone wolf defies the traditional definition of terrorism. Terrorism tends to be a collective enterprise, as we defined earlier. The lone wolf chooses his own path, but like any other, these solitary fighters, they are totally dedicated to their cause and can be extremely violent. The internet is a, I don't know, the boon for lone wolves because it makes it easier to communicate extremist messages and learn terrorist skills without actually having to join a group. In the U.S., lone wolves make up, made up uh, almost 42% of the total terrorist incidents over the last two decades, 
80% were involved in domestic issues rather than international issues. Um, lone wolf objectives, they vary. The Ted, Kaczyns the Ted Kaczynski, our Unabomber, was protesting advanced technology. The Tsarnaev uh, brothers, the Boston Marathon bombers, even though there was two, they, was, they still fit the category here of the lone wolf terrorists. And um, in that they acted without supervision of a unifying group. They were loaned, loaned together, but they were motivated by the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, but they had no ties or connections to any groups. These individuals tend to isolate themselves from society, but communicate with outsides uh, with statements threats, letters, manifestos. They actually, most of the time, claim that there's an attack coming or one is imminent. So those uh, are contemporary forms of terrorism. The next question we have to answer is, what motivates terrorists to do what they do? 